So we give honor to our Lord, our Savior. We thank God for all that has transpired in the service. Thank God for this special day that God saw fit and already had ordained. Praise God for us to, uh, to praise and worship his name. And regretfully later on this afternoon, amen, we will be officially ordained and installed. Succession, praise God, and there's a way for chosen ministries to go forward. That was my desire. Praise God, a way for the people of God to be able to go forward in the things of God. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. The last couple of days, you just been have been full of joy and tears and laughter and exuberance over what God has done. Amen. We look back over our shoulder to about 12 years ago. Amen. We were. Young in the faith, young in everything, just getting started. We did not know what God was up to. We just knew that God was up to something. Amen. Amen. The truth be told, you don't always have to know what God is up to. Amen. You just need to know that God is up to, to something. Right. Yeah, but That's we're right. thankful. Amen. We have brand new elders, brand new pastors. Amen. 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 God is new. Amen. This morning, but the, the, the glory goes to God. This is right. chosen ministry's day. This is your day, Amen. It's good. Amen. So if you don't mind, I want to preach just for a little while. I only need about two and a half hours of the time. All right. All right. All right. Two hours? I can even wait that long for it. But as always, we want to um, declare a few things before we get into the sermon. And if you don't already know the thing for this month, the thing for this month, the thing for this month is building the house. So for the Sundays and the time we have for this month, we're going to be talking about building God's house. Amen. And we're not talking about building the building. Right. We're talk, talking about building the true house of God, yes, which is us. Yes. Which is kind of peculiar because Wednesday night, for those of you that sat in Bible study, praise God, Elder Poole talked about the history of the church. And then I said, Lord, that goes right in line with what you're saying to us, that we need to put more focus and emphasis on this house than we do on this house. If you missed that Bible study, you really missed it from part one. So log on this Wednesday. He's got four or five. I don't know how many parts he's got, but he's got different parts. He's teaching us about the history of the church, the, the nature, the different things that the average churchgoer may not know or understand. But he's he's given us, he's arming us for what's out there. Amen. Amen. He's given us, uh, he's given us Chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 10 
and 11. But for those of you that like to frame the text and put it in context, please read all of Nehemiah chapter 1 for the sake of time and what we're going to be discussing. We're going to talk from chapter 1 verse 1 all the way down to 11, but for the text, I'm just going to read verses 10 and 11. But understand as you go back and study, that a lot of the fruit of this message is found in the earlier passages of Scripture. Amen. When you have it, say amen. Amen. It says, now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire, who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Right. Amen. Amen. For our text, it'll make sense, y'all. Just throw it before a little while. It'll make sense in the end. For our text today, God is, we're talking about restoring the walls of faith. Restoring the walls of faith. Not exciting, praise God. I may not hoop this morning, but I will give you something to grow by. And, and just for a brief introduction before we pray, if, if you read the book of Nehemiah, he's been called to help rebuild the temple of God. But they were, they were flowing out of captivity, going back to the land, going back to their place, only to find that it's not how they left it, not how they envisioned it. Two generations passed before they were able to go back to what it is God told them they could have. But when they got back, it looked different than what their forefathers told them about. So God, he inquired of them and told them to rebuild the temple and rebuild the people of God. And that's what we're going to do today because this generation is not the same generation that actually started church. But we have been told what church is supposed to be like. We have been taught on who God is and what God does. So now it's our job not to look at what we see, but to find out what we see in here and rebuild the church from the ground floor all the way up to the rafters. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to maximize this time and speak to us out of the volume of your holy book. Words of life, clarity, authority, and conviction. We stand at the ready to receive the infallible truth in your word today. Feed us. Until we are spiritually satisfied, feed us until we are armed and forearmed with your knowledge and wisdom, love, and understanding. We thank you. We give you glory, honor, and praise because you alone are worthy. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may have your seats in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, ushers, for your kind and friendly service. Thank you, Sergeant at Arms. We appreciate your service. All right, let's go to work. <clears throat> To be redeemed simply means to be bought with a stipulated price, to buy back, to recover, or exchange. It is imperative for us as the people of God to know, understand, and be cognizant to the fact that we are the redeemed of the Lord. Amen. Does anybody understand that you are the redeemed of the Lord this morning? Yes, Amen. He brought us with the price, ransomed his own life on our behalf. However, after redemption, there is a restoration process that must occur. Redemption is likened unto the biblical term justification. Amen. Restoration is likened unto the term sanctification. That we are justified by faith, but after God justifies us, we work for restoration to be brought back, to bring back to a former, original, or normal condition, or to reestablish. Well, in other words, after we get saved, we are justified. But the restoration process comes, and it comes into play when we begin to realize and understand who God called us to be. Yeah. That the Bible tells us that he knew us before the foundations of the world. Your call was there before you were there. God understood what he wanted you to do before you understood what your name was. So it becomes our job to be restored back to the place where God said we can be. Amen. God had redeemed the children of Israel, but they had to start the process of restoration. They went back to their land only to find out that the walls had been broken down and the gates had been burned with fire. 
And perhaps, beloved, this is the dilemma that we are confronted with today in the contemporary church in that the church is full of the redeemed of the Lord. Because we say it all the time, let the redeemed of the Lord, oh, you've heard that before. But how many of us have been restored? How many of us really know and understand the intent and the purpose for which God created us? That we all have been bought with a price and we all have a job and a lane and an assignment that God wants us to operate in. Praise God. The church needs to be restored to the original purpose and power by the presence of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I ask you that real quick, have you been filled? Amen. And if I had time and if I had another sermon to preach, I would open the altar and ask anybody that desires to be filled with the Holy Ghost to make your way down to the altar so we can give you the enabling power of God to function and do what God called you to do. But perhaps another time, praise God, but you have to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you can't be a witness to what God is doing because the Holy Spirit becomes the witness to the power of God. Now more than ever, we need the restorative hand of God in this modern day church. We are the last hope for this dying world that God is calling people out of darkness into his marvelous light. And those that have been redeemed and restored will be the witnesses in this last and evil day. Praise God. I got three points I'm going to give you, and then I'm going to take my seat. Number one, new generation, new move. This is a new generation, so this is a new move. If I were to put it in scriptural vernacular, it's going back to Jerusalem. Because two generations had passed before they actually were released to go back to Jerusalem. So the people of God have been thrown into captivity, and for some time now, a Persian king named Cyrus came to power, and he was in control over most of Mesopotamia at the time. So he released the children of Israel out of captivity and caused them or allowed them to go repossess the land that God said that they could have. If I were to give you a commercial real quick, somebody here needs to repossess what the enemy has possessed in your life. Amen. That ain't a part of the text. I'm going to give you that one free. Somebody in here needs to go and repossess what you gave. He didn't take it from you. He didn't steal it from you. You laid it down. You laid your peace down. You laid your joy down. You laid your house down. But somebody needs to go back and repossess what it is that you let the enemy have. Praise God. Now, what held them while they were in captivity is that they were taught the promises of the Lord. For those of you that may not understand, they sat around in villages, and the elders, the only ones that could probably read or write or have the scrolls, would teach them about the 12 gates to the city. They would teach them about this beautiful place called Jerusalem. They would teach them about their heritage, because the only way it got passed was through the elders in the camp or in the city that verbally passed down what God had done and the way that Jerusalem was supposed to look like. So, a whole generation beloved died in captivity but God rose a remnant up out of that place to be taught of the Lord so when this remnant came back home when they returned to Jerusalem it was not the same Jerusalem that they had been told about understand imagine someone telling you a story about this beautiful place about the, 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 the 12 gates and the streets are paved with gold and, and everything is beautiful and lovely. And when you get to the place, you see that the place has been burned with fire and the gates have been ripped down. And, and everything that you thought you knew about that place did not come to pass when you laid your eyes on the place. This is the dilemma the children of Israel faced that they had been redeemed, but now they had to go and restore what, they, what God has said that they could have. They looked to see what their fathers told them to be a glorious city, but when they got close, they smelled the stench of the smoke. And the closer they got, they saw the gates torn down. The closer they got, they saw smoke rising from what used to be this beautiful city called Jerusalem. So they sent word back to Nehemiah, who was the cupbearer for Artaxerxes, saying, we need to rebuild and restore this place because we are impoverished and the walls of the city have been broken down. We need to build back what it is that God said. Point number two, know what to build. Everybody can build, 
But you need to know what, okay? You need to know what to build. Nehemiah mourned, fasted, prayed before God before he moved. And coincidentally, that is a prerequisite for a mighty move of God. That before you can move, you have to first mourn for your own sins, mourn for the sins of the world, and you need to fast and pray before you move. Somebody say, fast and pray before you move. Fast and pray before you move. You fast and pray before you move. Don't move and then say, God bless my move. I wonder if we were to be honest today, how many of us have moved and then turn around and say, well, God bless what I just did. Bless my move, but God wants you to pray before you move. He wants you to have enough foresight to pray, watch this, pray, and then wait. Hey, sometimes you got to pray and wait. I know a preacher won't tell you to do nothing, but sometimes you got to pray and wait and do nothing till God says something. I real quick tell your neighbor, don't do nothing else until God says something else. I know that's bad English, but that's good teaching. Don't do nothing else until God says something else. Do I feel my help coming on. I thought I was going to teach today. I better slow down. Too often do we move before God says something. We pray and we give God a laundry list of what we want to accomplish, but we don't even sit to wait to see if God is going to answer it all. We say, well, I perform my duty. I prayed about it. Let me get on up and do something. If it be the Lord's will, the Lord's will be done. But I come from the old church where we used to fast and pray. They had what they call tarrying services. We didn't just pray, we prayed and we tarried. We didn't just tarry for the Holy Ghost. We tarried for a move of God. We didn't have a service. We didn't just do anything and say, God, I put the service together. Bless this service. No, we pray, God, if this be your will, if this is something, can we take the land? Before we move, one more time say fast and pray before you move. So Nehemiah requested of the king, can I go back to Jerusalem and help them rebuild this city? So and to put it in our terms, we must rebuild in every way so that we don't become a reproach on the cross of Christ. Here they're talking about physically building back the city, but I want to show you building in phases that the modern day church should first build people. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know that ain't popular, but we've got to first build people. We have put too much emphasis on the edifice, not enough emphasis on the people inside of the mm -hmm. that We ought to work harder to build people than we do to build the church or the building of the church. We should also build the kingdom of God. That if his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ought to build the church. When I say church, I mean ecclesia. We ought to build our connection with one another. Baptists should start fellowshipping with Pentecostals. Pentecostals should start fellowshipping with Methodists. We should all come together for the benefit of the call out of God. Truth be told, we just worship in different ways. Truth be told, we just have different ways. But we're approaching one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And once we get that in our minds, that there's only one God, we'll scramble to get together. We'll learn from one another. We'll try our best to shut down the walls of denominationalism. You see, we're torn down the wrong walls. We need to tear down the walls that the enemy has set up. He wants us divided. He wants us to be segregated. He wants us to be racist in how we worship God. But there's one church that God wants ordained. There's one church that God wants to be in this earth realm. I shouldn't be ashamed to worship with you. You shouldn't be ashamed to worship with me. We ought to be able to go in anybody's house, anybody's church. And the Lord is there. I feel welcome. I don't care if you have on the two and the four or the one and the three. I don't care if you sing gospel or hymnals. As long as the Lord is there. That's where I want to be. That's, the, that's, that's where I want to be. I want to be where the Lord is. I, I don't care if it's a 
church house or the outhouse. I don't care if it's in your living room or on my job. That if the Lord is there, I don't need padded pews. I don't need AC or heat. I don't need carpet on the floor. I don't need fancy musicians. All I need is the Lord. Y'all ain't know. I don't even know if y'all understand what the words that are coming out of my mouth. The church has been left indifferent and set apart from the mainstream of what's going on. We've been held in captivity so long uh, they expect us to sit quietly in our little church uh, and clap our little hands uh, to our invisible God. Uh, they expect us to sing our songs uh, but not really expect any change. Uh, they don't mind us coming to church as long as we don't become church. Uh, I do, I do another pool. I'll say that again. Uh, they don't mind us coming to church uh, as long as we don't become the church. You will find, beloved, the moment you decide to become the church, you will affect change everywhere you go. The moment you decide to become the church, you will carry church with you on your job. You will carry church with you into the Walmart. You will carry church with you everywhere you go because you realize I am the church. I am the church. So, the enemy expects us to enjoy our newfound Jerusalem, even though the walls have been broken down. While they are owning and controlling everything from Wall Street to the White House. They're changing everything to please the flesh. Even the natural design and desire of God has been changed. Yeah. And because we have lost our voice, the change occurs with little to no resistance from the church. In fact, the church has joined in the madness. You will find evangelicals are jockeying for position on a political ideology. You will find that evangelicals are, are, are positioning themselves to receive from a political party and not telling their people that the wages of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life. So the restrainer, the restrainer that keeps the Antichrist from taking over is being weakened because the church is falling into an apostate position and teaching heretic teachings when we should be standing flat-footed and saying that if this doesn't, if this doesn't meet the endorsement of God, then we can't endorse it either. Uh, who's gonna be? We've joined in two. Instead of coming against what the enemies and the Antichrist is doing, we are actually supporting and endorsing an Antichrist-like agenda. I don't know if you really understand, but Republican and Democrat are just two different sides of the same coin. <laughs> Not a political sin, but I just want you to know it don't matter if you voted for Trump or Biden, they're all a part of the Antichrist agenda. That, 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 that you vote your political preference, but your hope should be built on nothing less. Hey. Come on, somebody. The Jesus blood and his righteousness. We have to be in this world, but we don't have to be out. Come on, somebody. We have to live in it, but we don't have to go full force forward. We are in another kingdom to where our king is the chief commander. The chief commander tells us what is right and what is wrong. Yeah, to abide by the laws, yeah, you gotta vote your preference, but understand that God is still in control. And we got to rebuild the house by the design and specs that God told us to build it by. If it does not meet God's approval, it should not meet our approval. Okay, very good. I will I'll wait for somebody to do it for me. So tell your neighbor one more time, know what to build. Okay, that was the wrong neighbor. Ask this neighbor, do you know what to build? Okay, that was the wrong neighbor. Ask one more neighbor, do you know how to build? Yeah. Oh, okay, that would brought it full circle. Uh, uh, because we, I mean, we build all the time. Amen, a street term, a colloquialism, a colloquial term is that when we are fellowshipping with our day ones and our people, we build them with them. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and sometimes you find yourself building with the wrong people. And if you build with the wrong people, you'll use the wrong materials and get the wrong results. But when you get saved, when you get sanctified, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you still ought to build. But sometimes you got to switch dance partners. I still love you, but I can't build with you anymore. You don't build in that anti now I need to build this kingdom Not that you're shunning the one you used to kick it with But you've got to switch partners You've got to change up sometimes And say i got to build with this person When I look at her She makes me want to pray When I look at him He makes me want to learn more And because I know that this is not my home I'm a pilgrim Soldiering in a strange land That I've got to put my hope On what's in the heavens Whatever the enemy throws your way, you're built, you have been designed 
said to take it and it bounce off of you. You've been designed to take every weapon uh, from the enemy. Somebody in here today, uh, the enemy has thrown everything at you uh, except the kitchen sink. Uh, but you still get up every morning uh, say, Lord, I still love you. Lord, I still bless you. Lord, I still praise you. Lord, you're still my source. Lord, you're still my strength. Lord, you're still my provider. Lord, you're still my way maker. You're still in hell. You're still in where you are. You're still the whole child. You're still my mission. You're still my sickness. You are my banner. I love you today. You were built to take it. You were built to take it. Don't let no devil tell you you can't make it. Don't let no friend of me tell you that you ought to settle for what's happening. You got super to add to your natural. And when I see Colorado, when super adds to natural, you will do great exploits. Mm. Y'all sit down, y'all sit down. Y'all sit down, y'all. Uh, so it's time to rebuild this city. We rebuild the city by focusing on the people in the city. Once the ecclesia starts walking together, then evangelism can occur. But we can't properly evangelize. Because when God sent the disciples out, he sent them two by two. He didn't say, you go, you go with this one, and y'all go. He didn't say, you, I know you don't like that one. So I can't pop you up with that one. Y'all yeah, gonna get it in a minute. He said, well, I can't put you with that one because y'all argued last week. He just told them to go two by two. So there had to be unity in order for them to go two by two. I'm sure Jesus wasn't picky with how he put them together. I'm sure that all of them could have flowed with each other. So, so, so until we get to the place where we go, just go beyond unity, go beyond unison, going into harmony, because harmony is different than unison. When you are in unison, everybody sings on the same key. Mm -hmm. The musicians know what I'm talking about. When you're singing in unison, you have a bass key. And the one lady that sings high has to compromise her voice to sing on this key. Deacon Dale that sings low has to compromise his voice to sing on that key. And everybody sings like that together because they're singing in unison. But God told me that it's a deeper step than just singing in unison. And that's singing in harmony. Once we sing harmony. The lady that sings high, she can stay on that high note. Dickie Dale can stay low, and he's comfortable where he is. And we just need somebody to hold the melody. Pastor Shy got the melody. I just need for my high singers and my low singers to feel comfortable in your own skin. Do what God told you to do. Do what God told you to do. We got to get past you and harmonize. who I am to try to fit in with who you are. God made me different. God made me unique. When God made me, he broke the mold. He said, I'll never make another one just like you. So stop trying to be somebody else. That role is already taken. Be who God called. Be who God. Nobody can beat you at being you. Oh yeah, they, they'll walk like you. They'll talk like you. They'll emulate your style and character and charisma. But when God anointed you, he anointed you for the job he wanted you to do. Too many fakes. Too many people parakeeting what somebody else did. In the Bible of Christ is going without because of parakeeting what other people have done. Elder Poole says something profound in Bible study when everything he said was profound, but this captivated my attention. When he said, when I first came, I, I wanted to be like Reverend Shy. I wanted to preach and hoop like Reverend Shy. But I said, I, and to myself, I said, I'm glad God didn't give you no hoop. 
He said he still want to hoop, but I'm glad he don't hoop. Because if everybody tries to parakeet past the shine, that's the equivalent of walking in unison. But if we're going to walk in harmony, chosen ministry got to receive the teaching as well as the preaching. Come on, somebody. Chosen ministry got to sit down and be taught some of the deeper things. We got to sit down, and if you don't tune it up like Reverend Shaw, if you don't hoop or run by the church and hawk and spin and jump around, we got to say, well, I still got a word today. He gave me meat for my soul. Because we hollering, because the preacher hollering. But if you want to know who really heard the sermon, catch him outside and say the whole service was good today. Or what the preacher talked about. I don't know, but he was that he did it. We want to be able to hear what the Lord said. If we're building, we got to build. Everybody has a lane, everybody has a purpose, everybody has something important to do. I was on my heart was broke last week when, when I realized that we weren't doing too much for the children and the youth. Because if we don't take time with them, those out there have already taken time with them. See, when, when they come to church, this has to be the counteracting, contradicting agent for what the world has told them. They ought to be able to come to church and, and get the skinny, get the teeth, get what's really real, and they have to decide what's was fake uh, when they get on TikTok uh, or Instagram uh, or Facebook uh, or Snapchat uh, all these different things that are vying for their souls uh, we can't bring them to church uh, and don't give them no meat uh, don't give them anything to help them uh, we've got to gird them up uh, and when a young person gets up uh, the whole church ought to be clapping uh, when a young person says a scripture or oh, does a prayer uh, the whole church ought to be exploding uh, when we see young people doing things in the house God, uh, there ought to be jubilation in that house uh, because God is working on the babies. Uh, in fact, uh, the babies uh, are going to bring forth the next great move of God. Uh, Y'all think it's coming from the bishop. Uh, Y'all think it's coming from the apostle. Uh, now it's coming from the babies uh, because God wants to show the devil. Uh, he wants to show the world uh, that he still is in control. Uh, it looks like we've lost uh, Generation Z. Uh, it looks like we're going to lose a whole other but God said it's time to build. If we build the house, how it's supposed to be built, we won't lose any more babies. These babies will grow up in the admonition and fear of the Lord. They'll yoke ministry because they want to. That's right. I don't know, it's my desire. That children, youth, and young adults come to church because they want to. That's, that's my desire. So we got to do whatever it takes besides compromising the gospel and the vision and the mission to have children come to church because they want to. So, I'm going to show you three walls of faith and then I'm going to stop. We need, while we're building, segments of people to perfect their lane and walk in. If you were to read about them rebuilding in Nehemiah, they faced a bunch of ridicule from the governors that were around them. But Nehemiah became smart. He used wisdom that when they started building, he had builders and he had watchers and he had prayers. Some of them were building with one hand with a weapon in the other hand. So we got to be wise as we build. That we building up the wall. The foundation is already set. Jesus Christ made the cornerstone. So now we got to build the walls. Nobody builds walls before they put the foundation down. Foundation has to be set and sure before you start building the walls. So we need somebody that's a watcher. Are there any watchers at church today? Yeah. 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 I mean, be honest, be honest. 
You are watching. You can see trouble coming from a hundred miles away. Watchers have high discernment. Watchers can see trouble no matter what trouble looks like. Watchers can sense something in the atmosphere and they're watching. While we are praising God with our eyes closed, a watch is praising God with one eye open. Not literally, but for fully. They're praising God, getting their praise on, but they're watching at the same time. Because the enemy's crafty, he's cunning. And the way the enemy works, he'll come as a friend. He will befriend you before he, he comes with what he really wants to do. Because he so desperately needs to get close to you. If he said, if I can get close to her, if I can get close to him, they'll confide in me something I can use against them. So, oh my God, watch who you allow to get close. Your circle should be preserved for who God wants them. Stop having your circle so big you got 25 people in your inner circle thinking that all 25 are for you. That, that number is way too big for, for, for there to be any amount of accuracy. Amen. You can have 25 friends, but I'm talking about your circle. Your circle ought to be tight. It, it, it ought to be reserved for those that God designated that could be there. What happens is we allow our fans to be designated as our friends. Oh. How many know that your fan really don't know you? Your fan knows what you do. Your fan gleans off of your ministry. But your friend knows you when you ain't ministering. Your friend knows you when you tell them off-color jokes. Your friend knows you when you don't have your suit on and you're sitting in the house enjoying football, basketball, baseball, or some movie. Your friends are those that are designated to know you in a deeper, more intimate way. Your fans will stop being your fan if you stop producing fruit in the kingdom of God. Oh my God. The same one that praised you will be the same one that said, I told you they weren't about that. But your friends are faithful are the wounds of a friend. Because your friend will be there when you're right. Your friend will be there when you're wrong. Watch this, your real friend will never rebuke you in front of company. They'll have your back. But when they get you behind closed doors, they say, you know you were wrong about that. You know you shouldn't have acted like that. You know that wasn't the right thing to do. How many of you have friends or fans? Watch out how you bring your fans closer. Because those fans are brutal. LeBron James had fans till he left Cleveland. When he left Cleveland, they started burning his jersey. So imagine if he took that personal. Man, these are supposed to be my friends. How they going to burn my jersey? Superstars have fans, but they have few friends. So be careful how you open up your circle yes. to people that aren't for you. Oh Lord, that's what we're talking about walls. Three walls of faith. Number one, literal walls. In the Bible, the walls of a city determine the vulnerability of that city. If they didn't have walls, they were left unprotected. Nothing worse than the feeling of, of, of being vulnerable to attack. So the people wrote to Nehemiah saying the walls have been torn down. We've been redeemed but not restored because without the walls over the city, anybody can come back and take us. I know y'all heard about the walls of Jericho. And if you don't know, the walls of Jericho were so fortified that they could actually drive chariots around the top of the wall. But so the wall was so fortified that it made the people on the inside feel safe until they came up against a God that was bigger than the walls that they had. They came up against a God that, that, that did not need weaponry to tear those walls down. When God was ready to tear down the most fortified wall that we've read about, he used the saints to pray. He didn't use the warriors, he used the worshipers. I wonder if anybody really understands when God is ready to go to war, he don't need physical tools. He just needs somebody with a mouth to praise, a mouth to worship, somebody that can shift the incredible, shift the atmosphere with the way that they worship. The wall has been built up in every other place but the church, but God has put wall busting power in your praise. Tell your neighbor, you got to use your weapon. You got to use that praise in order to bust down these walls. You can't come against the enemy with violent you got to lift up the name of Jesus.
Jesus. You got to call things to shake and shatter because you refuse not to praise God. With all that is within me, I'll bless his holy name. I will bless the Lord on my soul. All that's within me. I'll bless him in the morning. I'll bless him on my lunch break. I'll bless him when I go home. I'll bless him when I got money in the bank. I'll bless him when my bank account is on zero. I'll bless him when it's in the negative. I'll bless him when I feel good. I'll bless him when my body's sick. I'll bless him when you like me. I'll bless him when you hate me. But I will bless the Lord at all times. And pray shall continue. The children of Israel wanted to build up walls. Because the enemy wanted to do an encore in their life. They kept going back to bondage, back and forth, in and out of bondage. The enemy, they said, we got to build up these walls so the enemy can't do an encore in my life. There's a feeling that of fear that will arise when you realize that the enemy is after you. Amen. If you don't know, let me tell you, the enemy is after you. You might have had a few days of reprieve, but he's provocating and plotting your demise. He's plotting against you right now, yeah. Sister Jane. <laughs> He's plotting against you right now, Elder Poole. He's plotting against you right now, Brother Hillier. He's plotting against you, Illinois. He's plotting against you, Daryl and Octavius. He's plotting against you right now. Yeah. Just because you have moments of cessation of warfare does not mean that there's not something around the corner. You ever got up and thought today was going to be a good day, and then all of a sudden on the way to work, this little old lady cuts you off in traffic <laughs> and triggers a that you know. <laughs> oh, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You say, man, I feel good today. This is going to be a great day. You mess around got on 70, and this little old lady driving 50 in the fast zone. And you trying your best not to. <laughs> And the first word that came to your mind is Congress's four letters. You say, Lord, I thought I was delivered from this. I thought the death was going to be a great day. And all of a sudden, as soon as you think you got it together, the Lord will show you where you really are, where your temperament really is. He you knows what you tell folks in church that you are holy and you got it going on and don't nobody ever get on your nerves and you get up praising God and you go to bed. From, but what the truth be told, when you think you got it going on, when you think you got it together, God will send that little old lady driving 50 and 70. And then when you try to get on she'll get over. And when you finally make it to work, your boss has had a bad day. And now he's getting on your nerves. And your whole atmosphere has been shifted. And you allowed a man to change the temperature in your head. Because you thought that you had it going on. But I come to tell you, never get up one day out of your life. Not expecting there to be warfare. Get up and say, Lord, I command this day to flow with you. Get me get on my nerves. to slow me down. 
for what God wanted. I, I, it wasn't there to destroy me. It was just a distraction. I didn't see it. I, I, I tried to entertain all my critics. I, I, I tried to, 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 to justify my name or to, to prove to them how I'm right and they're wrong. And I spent a lot of time crying over wasted time. But I'm getting a little bit too old in my life uh, to worry about who likes me and who don't like me, who supports me, who endorses me. I know that God got a plan. And if God got a plan, I've got to get in the middle of his will. If I get in the middle of his will, when the enemy will come against me, he'll come against the word of God. He'll come against what I've been taught. Somebody need to stay in the center of God's will. Don't wait to the right. Don't wait to the left. Let the enemy work to get in. Get in your life. But walls, walls, literal walls. They wanted to build literal walls in Jerusalem because they felt protected if they had walls surrounding them. And the reason they wanted walls is because once you get delivered for something, the possibility of it coming back can be debilitating in your life. The second wall are figurative walls. Figurative walls. What walls are to Jerusalem, ministry is to the believer. Those, those walls protected them physically. Ministry protects us spiritually. This is why we have five-fold ministry. At the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. They become walls of protection for me. Mm -hmm. That's why I come to church to get the walls built up in my life. The walls that get built up in my life keep me from relapsing. Because mm -hmm. you wouldn't like me on the other side of the will of God. You, you wouldn't like me in, in, in the absence of the Holy Ghost in my life. I wouldn't be very pleasing. I wouldn't be good company without God in my life. So I come to church to get my faith built up, to get my walls built up, because in the absence of having God in my life, I will relapse to the person I used to be. If somebody tell your neighbor, you wouldn't like the person I used to be. Oh, no, no, no. You wouldn't have no tolerance for the man that I used to be. So, so the person you're sitting beside, you ought to tell them, thank God I'm a new me. Oh, come on, tell them, thank God I'm a new me. If I wasn't a new me, there'd be some trouble up in chosen. If I wasn't a new me, somebody would be in trouble. I probably wouldn't be here. But I thank God that he regenerated me me clean. Uh, watch this. Uh, I still have those thoughts, uh, but I have enough foresight in the Holy Ghost uh, not to act on every thought that comes to my mind. Uh, if you act on every thought, say what's up, somebody like, well, I'm going to just say what's on my mind. Oh, the devil is a lie. Because the same words you are saying, uh, somebody else got something in their mind about what they want to say about you. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, we, we throw up to then hide our hands. Uh, we pick on somebody, then play the victim when we get on their last nerve. Uh, but you got to be able to hold Peace, be slow to anger, slow to speak, be happy at the Lord fight. At the Lord fight. And what figurative walls do is they build up your knowledge base of the Word of God. Let me show you something. I'm almost there. So I'm going to tell you in five more minutes. I don't know how long I've been up there. I haven't said my wrong this morning. The word starts out literal. It starts, it starts out figurative, but becomes literal. Let me show you. The Bible says, Thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Mm -hmm. Even you're hiding the word in his heart. Figuratively, by learning and reading and studying God's word. The literal part, when it keeps you from sinning, mm, because you got the word of the Lord in your heart. That, that might not resonate with you. The word is a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. The word of the Lord doesn't physically come like the figure of the path before your feet, but it illuminates the light in your mind. When it illuminates the light in your mind, you will physically watch how you walk. <laughs> there are some places you used to go that you won't go anymore. There are some things that you used to do that you won't do anymore because the word is living and it's breathing and it's moving. You can read a scripture today, read it again a week from now, and get additional revelation because it's breathing and it's a living word. I want to think about the red scripture. Got revelation from it. I, According to what you were going through, read the same scripture two months later, and God showed you something totally different. He illuminated, oh my God, He illuminated the moment of that word. That's why you can never think you got it all together. Never think that because I read the Bible from back to front uh, that I know God's word. You can read God's word, uh, but I dare you to pray before you read it. I dare you to say, God, give me some revelation. 
Jesus. Show me what's going on in my life. Show me what to keep. Show me what to share. Show me where I am in this word. And watch God. Turn literal. Turn that word. I must have the word. I'm about to come home. I got to have the word. If I don't have anything else, I need a show enough preacher. Or a show enough teacher. I need somebody that know what they're talking about before they get up here and grab this microphone and try to teach me anything. Amen. I'm so into the word. I get excited about what the preacher should have said. <laughs> I'm so into the word. I finish off where I, I start off where he left off. If you didn't take me where I thought the Holy Ghost was going, I thought it finished it myself. And, Whoa, that was a good word in there. You see, you should never be able to come to church and don't get anything. Because right. right. you can only get out of it what you. Yeah. You ain't read no word all week. The preacher can tell you anything. Right. He can tell you Mary had a little lamb and how the church was still going. Y'all think I'm playing? No. No. You got to have knowledge of the word for yourself. Somebody say, put some skin in the game. Yeah. When the preacher tells you to open the Bible, that shouldn't be the first time this week you open when the praise team say give God some praise that should be the first time you with you gave God some praise this ought to be an overflow what happened in your church you can call it what I just said what we do in this church ought to be an overflow of what you did in your church <laughs> oh my goodness because if you praise God at home it'll be easier to praise God here it don't matter if somebody gets off or they play the wrong key or they play the wrong song. It won't matter. You came with a praise on your lips. You came with a song in your head already. So what you do here is just an overflow of what you did yeah. Yeah. at the house, the original church, the original place where God ought to be honored and glorified, the original place where God spoke to your spirit, the original place where he healed, delivered, and set you free, the original place. Stop waiting for the church to open to hear from God. Stop waiting for Sunday morning for, for something to happen in your life. You can make it happen on Monday through Saturday if you really were prayerful and prayerful. You can go before God in your bedroom, in your slippers, on your way to work. You can go before God and get a word from God. What well, anybody ever got a word from God on your way to work? Anybody ever was listening to your music and you just started crying? There was nothing wrong with you. And the person beside you looking at you like you're crazy, but you think Lord, I know. 
know you didn't bring me this far just to leave me. I know this temple is, is not going to last forever. Then one day, God, you're going to give me a better body. But until you give me a better body, a better body I'm going to bless you in this broken body. I'm not going to let my pain stop me from giving you praise. I'm not going to let my issues or my circumstance stop me from giving you glory. All the glory belongs to you. So if I got to live in the church, I'm going to give you the best praise on my one leg. If I got to come hurt over because my back is hurt, Lord, I'm going to make it anyway. And I'm going to give you some kind of praise because you allow me to be here. Circumstances don't change God. So don't let them change you. He deserves your praise. He deserves Bible says a man without discipline is like a city without walls. You can't control your own self. Then you're just like a city without walls and the enemy will creep in. Watch this. Once you get delivered, it's the time you got to start filling up with the word. Because once God delivers you, you can't leave that house empty. When you leave that house empty, you're telling the enemy, well, I got delivered, but I ain't got no walls to keep you from coming back. You ain't got no walls to keep the devil from coming back. He don't ever come back alone. I'm in the Word. I'm in the Bible. He'll come back with seven more. Worse off than he is. Because you said, and this is where the church stops. Well, we stop before that sometimes. Most often times we get people to the cross. Then leave them there. We get them saved. But we don't follow up with discipleship. Or perhaps they'll come back and we get them delivered. And we leave them at deliverance. But every stage merits, they be taught something different. Can't get a, you can't get a, a child saved and they get mad because they're a new convert that don't know how to live right. Tell your neighbor, that's what you for. You the seasoned person. You ought to follow up with them, walk with them. And, and ask yourself, did I, did God just deliver me from everything overnight? Come on, somebody. Some of us in here today are yet being delivered. And if we were to real, be real honest, we're going to be honest with each other, but some of us are, are, are yet being delivered. We're not where we want to be, but thank God we're not where we used to be. Watch this. Oh my God, I got to go. See, somebody's thanking God. They don't cuss. As much as they used to. <laughs> See, this ain't, this ain't good church vernacular, but it's good teaching. Because it brings us all home. It brings us to a place where we're being real and honest with each other. Because we won't give a testimony until we made it or somehow I made it over. But the true testimony is I thank God that the, the beat is tremendous when I'm locked deep in the trenches. Mm -hmm. That the enemy comes hard after me when I'm in my low place and I don't always pass with the grade of A. But I thank God for his grace and his mercy. Mm -hmm. Somebody ought to give God a hand clap of praise for his grace and his mercy. Y'all clap like y'all deserve what God did. When we build a house, there are steps that have to be taken for us to build ourselves back up. God wants you to have the satiety of small victories. Stop waiting until the battle is over before you shout. Go and thank God for this day because he protected you from something you didn't even know about. Some of you made it to church today and God held back the car accident just so you can get this word. Just because, just because he loved you, he'll allow you. You don't know what's out there waiting for you. You don't know the warfare that's waiting. If we could actually see the warfare, we, uh, we'd grow all gray hairs on our head, heads and some of us would fall over and die. We could see the amount of demonic warfare waiting for us. But we thank God for his grace and his mercy. Restoring the walls of faith. Next week we're going to continue on with building. We're trying to build a man from the inside out. We have spent too much time on 
on building church, not enough time on building people. God wants us to build each other up on our most holy thing. And in order to do that, sometimes we got to go into the deep, dark places where we don't want anybody to know. Sometimes we got to do some spring, spring cleaning. Sometimes we just got to be honest and say we're all on the same playing field. From the pulpit to the back door. We're all swimming in the same direction, fighting against the same current, fighting against the same temptations and the same enemy. Don't let anybody tell you they're super safe. Don't let anybody tell you that. Don't let anybody tell you they, they're super duper safe. They got it all together. Don't let anybody tell you that. Because all men have from the soul of the glory of God. The beautiful, beautiful thing about that is we have grace and mercy to abound and we know how to go back before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Give me another chance. Got to stay away from those super saved folks. And let me tell you, because they have made the gospel of Christianity and sinners' minds unattainable. But I can never live that holy. I can never be like that person is. And they want you to be perfect in public while they're pressing in private. Then we give unbelievers an unrealistic expectation of what it's like to be saved. Yes, yeah, work. Sometimes it's hard work. But there's plenty of joy. Plenty of laughter. I don't know anybody that laughs more than Pastor Shot. I enjoy myself. I hope y'all don't think I go home all day and just pray for y'all. I hope y'all don't. I do pray for y'all, but I hope y'all don't think I spend all my time. Trying to enjoy. I enjoy being a Christian. I enjoy being saved. And not just for eternity. I enjoy being saved right here. Enjoy. I ain't got to turn up the whole 40 ounce just to smile. I enjoy. I ain't got to roll one up just to have some intellect or some, some type of force. I enjoy. I enjoy having a sober mind and still have joy. I ain't this person today. And that I'm the same all day long. I enjoy being saved. I love. And in fact, your salvation experience is only a small portion of your total experience. Right. I'm going to say this, then I'm going to bring it home. I'll if I had a tape measure, this is the beginning of the tape measure. If I pulled it out to one inch, that's the equivalent of your earthly experience. If I were to keep pulling it all the way out to 24 inches, that's your life after earth. Hallelujah. 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 One inch of the 24 inch root. Bring it, bring it, bring it. I'm going to let you go after this, I promise. Hold the end of it. When you're measuring life, be careful not to measure the totality of your life by the time you spend here on earth. Because if you were to really do a, 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 an assessment of your life as you pull it out, that's your earthly experience. Because man is accounted days and numbers and a day to die. Yeah. But after your body dies, your spirit lives alone. So if you spend all your life preparing for this small portion of your life, not taking into account, you got more and more and more. <laughs> you got more life to live after that body dies. After your body dies, you're going to live on. So you've got to spend a portion of your time way down there preparing for way down here. Build your hopes on things that are eternal. Mm -hmm. Build your hopes on things that are going to last forever. Mm -hmm. Build your hopes on the afterlife. Build your hope that when you get to the end of the tape measure, you'll see the person that you witnessed and ministered to that brought them to the cross. You are to prepare. And the tape measure keeps rolling on and on and on. For the purpose of the illustration, we'll never get to the end of what God has for us.
for us. But we've got to prepare way back there for what God is going to do way down here. That's why the church has to build up people more so because when the Lord comes back, he ain't coming back for a church. He's not going to scour the land to see which church looks the best outside. When he comes back, he's going to show himself and everybody that looked like him just going to be caught up to me. Good God the mind. And the churches will be left here to rot. So we're to build on oh God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for maximizing and speaking to us out of the volume of your holy book. We are learning, Father God, through the, the, the lesson in the Bible studies about church. Show us who we really are. Show us your face that we can see you more clearly. Heal and deliver us from all infirmities, all afflictions and addictions. Let your perfect, honest, and holy will be done in the name of Jesus. Father God, we send our special prayer for everyone in the congregation. You know what they need. You know how bad they need it and how long they've been needing it. Meet them at the point of their need, God. Meet them where they need to be met, God. Turn it around for them. Fix it. Heal and deliver and set free. We thank you. We thank you right now. And we bless your holy name. We love you today. And we honor you. These are the blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Before we close, I would like to open up the doors of the church if anybody wants to join. Chosen Ministries, worshiping at Chosen Ministries Christian Center. The doors of the church are open. We will receive you with open arms. Praise God. Mm -hmm. If not, I will bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. All that's within me, I will bless His holy name. Mm -hmm. Thank you.